Welcome to Black and Marine Science Week 3. I am Jordan Jess. I'm a Tallahassee native and a community activist, and I graduated this year with my Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science with a focus in marine biology and a specialization in communications and graphic design. I'm also an artist, so I've combined my two passions and I use art and digital media to keep my communities excited and engaged in all things science. I will be moderating today's discussion with Dr. Lonnie and Simone Barkley and Mark. In today's panel, we will be discussing NOAA's National Marine Sanctuaries and celebrating the 50th anniversary of National Marine Sanctuary System, which works to project special places in the oceans and Great Lakes. Viewers are invited to join the discussion via BIMS TV. We also have an awesome group of panelists lined up, and I'm excited to, and I'm excited for them to introduce themselves. First up, we have Dr. Lonnie Gonzalez. Lonnie served as a science division chief within NOAA National Centers for Coastal, Coastal Ocean Science. In this role, Lonnie leads a highly, a highly disciplinary group of scientists that produce applied research, new tools and technology and forecast products that address coastal pollution. This includes creating science to help prevent and mitigate human health and economic impacts of harmful algal blooms monitoring the impacts and assessing the impacts of coastal chemical contaminants on the coast and conducting applied research to assist the conservation and stewardship of reef habits. Prior to stepping into this leadership role, Lonnie has served as a research scientist at the Conservative Oxford Lab, where he supported various studies addressing the land use and environmental quality in the Chesapeake Bay with an emphasis of fish health and habitat. Lonnie is an alumni of the National University of Maryland Eastern Shore, where he earned his PhD through the support of NOAA's Office of Education. He is a native of North Carolina and attended East Carolina University in his BS in biology. Simone Barkley. Simone serves as the national as the National Ocean Service Exhibits Manager and Education Specialist. She works to increase public awareness of products and services NOS provides through outreach at conferences, workshops, festivals, and other events. Through her support of NOAA Education, Simone is committed to, to mentoring students, amplifying the work of women, Black and underrepresented scientists and educators in creating authentic and effective systems to recruit and retain traditionally excluded groups in ocean science. Simone also hosts Ocean Today Every Full Moon, a collection of videos showcasing the beauty and mystery of the ocean realm while exploring various ocean topics. Mark Lasavio. Mark Lasavio serves as the media and outreach coordinator for Monitor and Malo's Bay Potomac River National Marine Sanctuaries. Currently working on technology, technologically innovative ways to bring sanctuaries to people. He works to share their science stories and relevance with the national audience. Hailing from Kentucky, Mark holds a bachelor's degree in marine science from the University of South Carolina and a master's degree in marine biology from Northern University. So we're just gonna get right into the panel. And I guess everyone can also kind of like introduce themselves as well if there were some things that I didn't touch on. I think you did a great job. I think okay, we're ready cool. to get, start right into those questions. All right, so um, we're gonna start with Simone and then we can go around the board. Um, so the first question I have for everybody is what made you interested in marine science? So um, I'm from Baltimore and I spent a lot of time in this neighborhood that's um, it's called it's called Cherry Hill. And uh, a lot of people in Cherry Hill, if you don't know about Baltimore, it's in South Baltimore and it's near a body of water, the Patapsico River. And uh, 
back in the day, like this is where a lot of black people used to fish. They used to like spend their time. There's like a little bridge that's over here um, near the near near the water. And you I would always see people, um, you know, fishing off the side of the bridge when I was younger. And then I lived in like this community that was right behind a, a really big park, Middle Branch Park. And so my grandmother and I used to like walk through the trees and like go down to Middle Branch Park. Never knew that the Patapsico River, which is where we were, was connected to the Chesapeake Bay, which mm -hmm. is, you know, a really, um, a really large estuary that's in the United States. And we heard the Chesapeake Bay when we heard Lonnie's background, right? We heard about him doing research in the Bay. And so um, the work that kind of like the thing that led me to being interested in marine science was that, you know, I spent time outside, like being outside, seeing water. That was interesting to me. It was fun. Um, it was a way for my grandmother and I to connect. It was in my backyard, but I had no idea, you know, the things that live there or, you know, um, how valuable it really was to the communities like the Black community that lived in Cherry Hill. And so, uh, when I was old enough to like figure out what I wanted to do, um, I decided that I wanted to do like a volunteer opportunity at the National Aquarium. National Aquarium is based in Baltimore, downtown Baltimore at the end of Harbor. And so I was an exhibit guide there. And as an exhibit guide, you had to learn about all of the like animals in all of the habitats and the exhibits in the aquarium. And uh, now the aquarium is a bit bigger, but I mean, back then it was still pretty significant. They gave us like this really large binder, like a, I still have the binder, a really large binder that is just a whole bunch of facts about so every cute. exhibit, about every animal. And we were expected to learn all of it. And when people came through the exhibits, they would ask us questions. So we had to know the answers, you know? And so... <clears throat> I was very excited to study and to learn about all of the animals. And so I would just read through it. And I like look back at it now and I have notes in there and like <laughs> quizzing myself to make sure I knew about all the animals, you know? Yes. And, so, and, uh, and then it was cool because they would give us like props, you know, right. that we could use on the floor as a way to like engage people. So this was like my early introduction to science communication something that is so common now and something that we didn't have a term for really back then. We might've called it interpretation or something mm. like that but it's definitely with science communication and it's a way for us to engage with people and so I remember having like a sawfish rostrum that was my favorite prop that I would have in Shark Alley and like talking to people about sawfish and why they're important and talking about the sharks that were there so that's really how I got interested in marine science and once I did that that um that program that was it. I knew that I wanted to study marine science. So after that, I went to Hampton to study uh, marine and environmental science and then went to Dell State to continue on and get a master's in natural resources. And now here I am. So. Yes, we love to see it. We really do. Mark, what made you interested in marine science? Um, that, that's not an easy question. I guess I've always kind of been obsessed with it. Um, but I will say that um, when I was young, um, me and my brothers, we all lived in the upstairs part of our house. And my mom, when she was, when she had just bought the house, for whatever reason, she decided to have like a local high school student paint the entire stairwell to be like the bottom of the ocean going to a beach. Um, I don't know why she did that. And for whatever reason, I was obsessed with that stairwell. I would always play in it. I would always like spend my time on the stairs, like being underwater. Um, so maybe that's where it started, but I, I did, as soon as I could, I got a job at the local pet store. Um, and they, it was like an exotic pet store. So they had saltwater fish. Um, and that was like the closest thing to me to working with the ocean because I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, which oh, is wow. pretty far away from the ocean. Um, yeah. our closest <laughs> public aquarium is actually in Cincinnati, which is like an hour and a half away. Dang. So the next best thing was to work at this pet store. And so I it's actually, like Simone said, this was kind of science communication before anybody was actually communicating science because I had to learn about like the nitrogen cycle, animal husbandry, behavior, territorial fish. I had to learn all of that and then tell it to people who wanted to buy fish. I had to be like, you can't buy this fish because you don't have the right chemistry in your fish tank. Um, and so learning all of that was fun for me. And it was so much fun that I thought, I'm going to keep doing it. I want to keep learning about this. So I, I did, I went to school at the University of South Carolina, which I was able to do because of the academic common market, which is like a, a consortium of Southern schools that allows you to take your in-state tuition and scholarships to a school that doesn't offer a major 
that offers a major that isn't offered in your state. So because I was from Kentucky, I could take my in-state tuition and scholarships to South Carolina because there was no marine science program. Mm. Um, and then I stuck with it. I was just obsessed with it ever since. And I haven't stopped. Oh, yeah. <laughs> obsessed. We love to see it. We really do. Lonnie, what made you interested in marine science? These are great answers. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I got a lot of similarities to with uh, what Simone mentioned that cultural connectivity early on mm. is such a big piece. I grew up near the coast of uh, North Carolina, and so you know the I, all early childhood memories of my dad taking us fishing and crabbing and frog gigging and being out there on the water. You know, my parents took us to the beach, and so we had that connectivity uh, from a recreational side, right? And and having that relationship there with the uh, ocean. I think the big piece for me, though, was that I, I didn't see it as a career. You know, it was just something that interests me. Right. Uh, and for me, uh, as an undergrad who was working in molecular biology and biotech cell biology, um, you know, I thought that it, essentially my career track was going to take me towards uh, pharmacy and biomedical research. It just happened to be one professor, Dr. Anthony Overton, at East Carolina University. He was the one that actually pulled me to the side. He was the one professor of color I had in my biology department that pulled me and he ended up pulling me to the side and asked me, hey, you know, what do you want to do? Uh, and at that time I was interested in graduate school opportunities. I remember telling him, Dr. Overton, I can't, I can't afford graduate school. I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I'll just go get a job. And, and he was the first one that told me, no, you don't pay for graduate school. You know, you somebody pays you while you go do your research. And he ended up connecting me to uh, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, uh, where I went to for my PhD, and through a NOAA program, uh, the NOAA Cooperative Science Centers, that was able to fund my research, provide me with a stipend while I was doing that graduate yeah. research, and tie me in to an actual NOAA lab doing NOAA-related research. And, and so that really, with that one connection, that one conversation, um, yes. that led me to an entirely new career track that even though I had the interest in marine science and environment, you know, I had that cultural connection, that career and professional development connection really came from that one conversation. And it was a game changer for my career going forward. Yes, that is awesome. Shout out to NOAA funding scientific education because I myself am also a NOAA CCME scholar. So that's really dope to hear. Like, seriously, we're going to go to the next question. Um, we can start back at Simone. I personally want to know, and people out there just kind of want to know, with you guys being out in the field and doing research, I know there's a plethora of like crazy experiences that you have. So if you can name like one or two or three um, your favorite memories out in the field, like the memories that you have that in those moments, you were like, yes, like I'm doing the right thing. Like this is exactly what I I want to do like this is this is it. Um, well, the things that come to my mind aren't necessarily the things that are like my reminders that I'm doing the right thing. Uh, mm -hmm. They're more just like things that happened that I'm like, mm -hmm. this is crazy that I've experienced this or that I saw this. Right. And I think that we can I can absolutely talk about things that remind me that I'm doing the right thing and some of the other questions for sure. But I want to talk about the things that I think uh, just caught me by surprise, because I think that that is also like a really interesting element of being a marine scientist is that like every day is different most times. Like you never know what it's going to be like. You never really know what you're going to get. Uh, so like when I was in grad school, for example, I studied sharks. I studied sand tiger and sandbar sharks in Delaware Bay. And I spent basically every day on a boat from sunrise to sunset, setting long lines, which is like these long ropes basically where we put hooks on them and try to get sharks and then, you know, collect data on the sharks, right? And so we do this all day for years, right? And so one day we were doing this and um, we, pulled up our long line and like this is something that happens but it's just interesting to see because uh, I'd never expected to see it so we were again targeting uh, sand tigers and sandbar sharks they're bigger sharks um, they um, can eat smaller sharks and do eat smaller sharks and one day um, we got a a 
a sand tiger that had been hooked on our line, but inside its mouth was a dogfish, which is a different species of shark, but a much smaller species than a sand tiger. And so when we pulled it up, like we're getting, you know, we're getting it closer to the boat and looking and there's a, a a shark inside the other shark's mouth. And it's crazy to see it. Like it, it there was there were news stories about it. They called it like a shark turduncan kind of a thing. You know how they talk about That's like crazy. like turduncan things? Like that is what they said this was. It was very interesting. Like that is that's bizarre. Like you never expect to see shark. Right. You never expect to see something like that. So that those are the experiences that like live in my brain, right? That I always think about like Oh my gosh, I never thought I would be seeing something like this. And I remember like when I first started studying sharks, my parents would be like, you're small and you're on that boat and them sharks big. And I don't know, Simone, like, I don't know like, what you're going to do out there. Like, what is that? What is wrong? You know what I mean? Like, that's my that's parents were concerned. <laughs> and then I'm seeing a shark that's eating another shark hanging off the side of the boat. Like, it was, it was a lot. And then another memory that definitely also lives in my mind is, the first internship I had was at um, this place called, it was called Comb back then, but now it's called IMET. It's the Institute of Marine and Environmental Technology. It's in Baltimore City. And um, it's like a biotechnology, marine technology lab. And I was in the algae aquaculture lab. Like that's what I worked on that summer. I like did an internship around like, um, like figuring out like the best way to optimize algae growth for uh, an aquaculture mm. lab so that they could feed the aquaculture uh, species that they were growing like oysters and different types of, 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 of fish. And so to do this, they were like, if, if you can imagine, there's a lab with like these really big plastic bags that include wa different colored water. That different color water is algae, okay? So there's like mm -hmm. brown, green, orange, all these different ones. These are different species of algae. And so I would have to like make this um, like medium to like grow the algae in, okay? And then like after, and then we would use that to feed, again, to feed the species that they were growing in aquaculture. But when the, the bag got low, we had to like start a new bag. And to start a new bag, we would like take a little bit out of the previous bag and put it into the new bag. To do that, you have to siphon. So you have to like take a tube, you know, and like suck some of the algae from one bag and like try to quickly like suck it and then like put it into the other bag really fast, right? So I would spend, I would do that in the beginning of me doing it. I definitely swallowed algae like multiple times because <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. It was, it was a lot. It was different. And so what, I didn't taste nasty. Huh? Did it taste nasty? I mean, it tastes salty. You know, it just mm -hmm. tastes like, it tastes like water, like salt water, you know what I mean? But it was, it was gross to just know that that's what I was doing. Like, it was yeah. a little nasty. Um, but that also, like, is ingrained in my mind. I didn't decide to continue my career as an algae culturist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but very, very, very happy for the people that do continue to work in that, in that type of environment. Uh, it was definitely, it was fun. It was different. It was a nice way for me to get introduced to the world of aquaculture and, um, and so I had a good time doing it, but I, I was not, I was not excited about continuing to, to suck algae no. from one bag to another. That, Those are my best memories, I think. That'll do it. That, that would, that would definitely deter me. As well. Mark, what are your top three memories out on the field? Uh, that's another tough or one. Two. Um, or two. Or one. I'll, 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 I'll just do, I'll just do two. Um, okay. And Full disclosure, my career with NOAA is just beginning. Um, I joined the Sanctuaries program almost two years ago, so I don't have a lot of memories to draw back on. Um, so I, I will give you one from another job that I had a work as an AmeriCorps member, mm -hmm. um, like in between jobs that I had a while back where I was working with the New England Science and Sailing Foundation and our job was to kind of run these after school programs for students of New London. Um, and teach them about ocean science and teach them how to sail, teach them how to kayak. And this one day, I think it was in like late summer or sometime in the summer, um, I was taking these, these kids out on a paddle in this like creek behind the office. Like these are kids who don't like, don't normally get out to see the beach that much or they don't know how to kayak or they've never kayaked before or that kind of thing. Um, and on one of our paddles, this humongous horseshoe crab 
just like crawls below us across the, the creek. Um, and so I like flip over in my kayak trying to get it, bring it all the way up and I'm holding, and it weighs, <laughs> it weighs like 50 pounds. It's a humongous horseshoe crab and I'm holding it in my hands and I'm walking it because it's not even, it's not a deep creek, it's really shallow. And so I'm walking it from kayak to kayak showing, and they're all terrified of it, obviously, because it looks like an alien monster. Um, so that's definitely something that's like locked in my brain forever. But since I started with sanctuaries, um, I have to give you a little bit of background because I was, I'm, I guess if I had to put a label on it, I'd say that I'm like a marine biologist because I got mm -hmm. my master's in marine <coughs> biology. Excuse but uh, the sanctuaries I work for, Monitor in Mallows Bay, Potomac River, National Marine Sanctuaries, those are two shipwreck focused mm -hmm. sanctuaries. Um, and so I kind of have had to change gears and do a lot of work regarding archaeology, which is not something I've been trained in, but something I've been picking up. So last summer, uh, we actually went out on a trip to do some side scan sonar mapping of shipwrecks in the Outer Banks, uh, oh, wow. which, which was just like normal, boring stuff for the like actual researcher in our office who was an architect. It was just like whatever, every day for him. But I was blowing my mind seeing shipwrecks, seeing stuff, anything, rocks come up on the screen that our like sonar torpedo thing was picking up. It was so cool. And it was just blowing my mind. That whole trip, I was just like beside myself with how cool it was. That is so cool. That is so cool. Oh my goodness. Lonnie, what about you? What are your three, one or two favorite movies? Yeah, on yeah for me, I'll, I'll, I'll pick two here. I'll pick one, I will say, uh, was my first time being out at sea on a research cruise on a NOAA vessel. Uh, we took off in January out of Woods Hole, Massachusetts on a 10 day uh, cruise. Um, you know, the good things about it, we were out there seeing stuff I had never seen before. You're collecting these fish surveys, they're throwing out those nets and you're collecting all kinds of different fish you hadn't seen before, learning about them. You're seeing the dolphins break. You see that sun come up over the ocean and all that. So a lot of great experiences there. But I was also seasick for the first few mm -hmm. And I say it was my one of my favorite experiences because it was the opportunity to get hands on, right? You're like, yes, this is a great chance to be a real marine biologist and oceanographer there. Uh, but yeah, I learned I could seasick. And um, in, in the midst of that, it allowed me to say, hey, you know what? Maybe sticking closer to the coast and in the bay is a smarter thing for me and tailoring my science towards that route. I still get seasick till this day. Uh, and so it really helped to step out into a new experience and yeah. really get that hands-on experience and enjoy it, but also use that experience to tailor sort of which uh, direction I wanted to go uh, in the future there. And, and a big part of, you know, I was doing a study on uh, striped bass at the time, Atlantic Coast striped bass, but we had people doing work with dogfish. You heard Simone mention dogfish earlier. We had people doing all kinds of work on various species. We had our team there. We had our oh NOAA Corps officers. It was a real cool group uh and on the people front of that i can still remember i'm a huge football fan uh i'm a fan of the pittsburgh steelers that was the year that last super bowl they won and we were <laughs> out on the ship when they were in the conference championship the game to see who goes to the super bowl and the captain turned that ship just enough to get us a signal and so we're in the galley with the NOAA Corps officers and, and all our research team there watching that game and had, had just a great time there. And it was just that teamwork and people aspects really came together there for us there. So it was cool on the science front, cool on the people front, uh, and really helped be a great experience. Um, uh, and the other one I'll just throw out real quick is, you know, being out in the field back again on the Chesapeake Bay where I learned, you know, that was more of my, that was more of my lane right there. Uh, you know, we did a lot of work out of the university and trying to go out and collect uh, striped bass on the bay, you know, mm -hmm. trying to use our own nets and our own poles and all that. But that doesn't work too efficiently there when you're trying to get a study going. Um, right. And it, it found out we had a standing partnership between NOAA and uh, Maryland uh, Department of Natural Resources there, where it was like, instead of us trying to do this ourselves, let's go out and work with local watermen to collect right. the samples that we need. 
And <laughs> one of those experiences was a farm family that they had their farm. They did hunting parties on their land, but they also were watermen. They worked that water um, both using pound nets to collect fish and did some crabbing and oystering and all that. You saw these folks who were really making their living off of the land there. And it was just so interesting to hear about their business and their family and that whole culture of being a waterman and how that environmental connectivity came into place with their own economic, right? Their own economic vitality and their own business there all coming together there. And so talking with people like that, those boots on the ground folks who are not scientists, but they're everyday users of the science uh, and engaging in the science there and in the environment has always been pretty awesome there. Awesome. That's wow. I love that for you. That that's that's a vibe. That sounds like a vibe for real. The next question that I have for Simone is what is the impact of what you do in your science and your research on your community? So I, I don't really do active research. Um, I'm an educator, a communicator, like outreach coordinator. So everything I do is about like people and it's about right you know engaging with people and so for example right we're talking about the the ocean today every full moon videos just as an example so those are videos that are video collections that show um different marine science topics or phenomena and those like topics um relate to people in different areas, right? So they relate to people who live on the coast, they relate to people that work on the ocean, they have, we have collections that are about aquaculture, that are about farming in the ocean. We have collections that are about horseshoe crabs, for example, because some people don't know about horseshoe crabs, even though they might cross paths with them very often in Delaware, there are so many horseshoe crabs that are on the beaches in Delaware. Um, and many people, if you like maybe visit Delaware beaches, you might not know what they are because they do look really interesting. They do, they do look kind of crazy. They do kind of look like aliens, like Mark was describing. So people might be scared, but they are harmless and they're very essential even to the medical field. And so I think that a lot of the things that we do and that I do as, uh, as an educator, as a communicator is to talk about how the ocean and the organisms that live in the ocean and, uh, and the ocean itself, like the water, right? How all of those things really impact our everyday lives. And we, even mm -hmm. though we may not know about it. And so um, as an educator, you know, I try to put together resources, you know, that teachers can use in the classroom so that they can introduce their students to ocean topics. And so if students want to learn about the ocean or if they even don't know that they're interested in learning about the ocean, they get an, an opportunity to, to learn about it so that if they want to go into marine science in the future, they don't have to wait until they're already in college to find out that they're interested or happen by chance to, you know, take a class or to, right. you, know, um, you know, to stumble upon it. And then they're like, oh, I wish I had known about this, you know, a long time ago. My my goal is to try to train the teachers to introduce this to their students very early on so that the students can feel like they are prepared to go into this field if this is something they're interested in. And even if they don't want to enter the field, they still know the value of the ocean so that they can advocate for it. Because mm -hmm. even if you don't want to be a marine scientist, that does not limit you from knowing mm -hmm. the importance of the ocean and knowing how you that's can make it. sure that you're connected to it. So that's, that's that's what I think the value is for, for what I do. That is valuable. <laughs> and that is important. Like, oh, yes. Emphasis on even if you're not interested in it. Absolutely. Just being the voice and an advocate. Just that awareness. That's yep. enough. That's literally enough. Absolutely. And that's, 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 that's dope. Mark, what about you? Yeah. Um, Simone and I actually kind of run a similar race in terms of what we do, whereas uh, mm -hmm. I, I really focus more on the like outreach and engagement part of um, my two sanctuaries specifically. Um, the, the research aspect is kind of uh, like my secondary position to that. Like I still help with the research, but my primary goal is to try and get as many people to learn more about their sanctuaries as possible. Okay. Um, and not just Monitor and Malice Bay, but all of the, the sanctuary system, because uh, it's just trying to help everybody in this country like take like ownership over their special ocean places. And I feel like 
and this might be a personal thing, but I feel like when people hear the word sanctuary, they're like, oh, okay, keep out. This isn't for me. This is not an area I'm allowed to go where it's like right. the opposite. Like sanctuaries are areas of our, our nation's oceans that are set aside for the people. It's it's for you. And so my a lot of the work that I'm trying to do um, is I'm trying to help get people into their sanctuaries, help bring the sanctuaries over to people and help find ways to connect them to their special ocean places mm. so that they have that connection to make and, 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 I don't know, maybe change their lives around that new view. Like how, what am I doing that can affect my sanctuary? Like I live in this area and everything I do relates to that sanctuary. I have this cool, I live in Texas. We have a national Marine sanctuary. I live in California. We have four or three, a lot of sanctuaries, like giving people that ownership of their special ocean places is kind of the impact that I'm trying to to have um, on the people with what I do. So. Trying and succeeding, you're doing great. You're <laughs> doing great. You're doing great because I just learned so more. So you just did your job. <laughs> Lonnie, what about you? Yeah, you know, one thing I will tell you I love about uh, the part of the organization I'm in is that we are specifically uh, geared towards doing applied science and applied mm -hmm. research. So, you know, our whole role is to look at ocean science and the type of science that we do in a way that those findings get into people's hands right. and they put them to use. And so specifically, um, there are two areas of my science division uh, that look at coastal pollution uh, and the impacts of harmful algal blooms. Uh, most folks hear about red tide a lot. And so you see where our science, for example, with harmful algal blooms, red tide, we actually do the foundational research and produce actual forecasts for harmful algal blooms. Uh, if you go to places like Florida where red tide comes in, um, that it can put off a toxin that gets in the air. Uh, mm -hmm. If you got people on the beach and the wind is blowing a certain way, those toxins actually get people sick and send them to the hospital. Uh, especially if they're asthmatic or if they're elderly or uh, have other conditions, compounding conditions. We actually do the applied research that produces a forecast that helps keep people out of danger, keeps them off the oh, beach wow. when there is uh, uh, potential impacts from those aerosolized toxins during mm -hmm. the red tide. Uh, oh, wow. We produce forecasts that actually help people in other, part, in other parts of the country, you'll have a bloom, the bloom produces toxins, it gets into shellfish, for example. And so you, if if you think about some of our Native American communities, especially that do a lot of subsistence harvest with uh, shellfish or places on the Oregon coast where shellfish provide such a big economic impact, our forecasts are going into actually telling people when it's safe and when it's not safe to harvest and it's protecting public health and it's growing um, the economy there. So I, I get pretty excited because our research does have that direct application to people's lives, uh, to the mm -hmm. livelihood of communities and to protecting public health and growing the economy uh, there. And, uh, and for me, I am all about pushing us to be able to continue to drive those benefits and those services towards yeah. all communities, you know, not just the major players that we see oftentimes uh, talking within the ocean science realm, uh, but making sure everyday communities, those that look like us, the black brown communities uh, and others are really uh, aware of the type of science we produce, they're accessing it uh, and really using it to be impactful uh, throughout uh, all of our coastal communities. Uh, there. Right. And I, I want to kind of pivot off one of the points that you made about the impact on your black and brown communities and the sanctuaries. And I kind of want to go, that kind of leads me into my next question. Um, and I guess if you, Lonnie, want to take it on or Simone, you want to start, we can start with you. Um, what is the agency doing to aid and help black and brown communities and the youth? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Um, when I think about this question, I, I partition it into two pieces. Okay. Um, one is on the science side, we talk about equitable service delivery, and I'll mention what that means uh, in a moment. Uh, and the other is on the sort of workforce diversity side, mm -hmm. is opening up opportunities there uh, for diverse individuals to really be participants in our science enterprise. Um, and so let me, I'll speak to the equitable service delivery one. One 
thing that has been emphasized, whether it's at the White House, whether it's at Department of Commerce within NOAA and all the way down to, you know, boots on the ground scientists like myself is having a consistent and concerted drive to understand uh, the needs and the challenges that are specific to many of our black and brown communities and to begin to uh, both develop new science and make sure those communities have access to our current science to really help uh, meet those challenges and really help uh, uh, help out those communities, especially, again, I'm speaking more for, so from the coastal side. Uh, and so, for example, I mentioned that uh, Horn for Algal Bloom forecast there in Florida, you know, we're taking concerted steps, even though this forecast has been out there for some years now, we're taking concerted steps to understand, hey, all our black and brown communities aware of that forecast and right. using that information to avoid that hazard. I got, yeah. I, I'm from North Carolina, but I got a huge extended family down in Florida. Um, my dad's side of the family is down there. They had 13 siblings uh, there on that What's side. Of the I, I got a huge family down there and asthma runs in my family. So mm -hmm. it's a matter of, hey, you're down in Florida, you're going to the beach. Are you aware that NOAA has a forecast that can keep you from going to the hospital for being on the beach on the wrong day? Mm. Um, that takes a concerted effort by us to go out and both fund, uh, plan, fund, and implement activities that allow us to say, hey, we're going to send our scientists down to listen at the community meeting, uh, to listen mm. to those diverse stakeholders and find out what their needs are. Right. Not just show up and say, here's something. Here you go. You right. know, here's something I produce. Take it, but actually bring folks in, bring these communities in that have not been necessarily listened to in this way, um, and start to develop this science in a way that reflects those specific needs. Right. Uh, and go out there and address the various avenues we have to uh, to to promote and make sure that those communities are aware of the science services we have. Um, you know, I think sanctuaries give them a shout out because, for example. They connected with uh, Afro Outdoor uh, some time mm -hmm. ago over the last few years there. You got this group that's all about advocacy for black and brown folks getting out in the environment, enjoying these recreational opportunities. And then we have sanctuary saying, hey, we would love to have you in the sanctuary. So how can we work together to promote sanctuaries as a great place to recreate and help expand uh, that ecotourism through Afro Outdoor? Those are the type of connections we're talking about when we talk about advancing equitable service delivery and ones I'm pretty uh, excited that we're pushing forward with. Oh, wow. um, I'll slide to Simone there to talk uh, a little bit more about that sort of recruitment in there. Sorry if I surprised you, Simone. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I think that, you know, in talking, you heard Lonnie talk a little bit about how he was funded through, you know, through NOAA um, Office of Education for some of his work at, at the graduate level. And uh, and I was also funded through through NOAA for my undergraduate, uh, for part of my undergraduate time and at the graduate level, too. And so in talking about, like, helping to build opportunities for students at minority serving institutions and, and HBCUs, NOAA is working um, hard to provide scholarships, internships, um, experiential experience, uh, you know, opportunities for students to learn more about NOAA related science. And I think it's very important that I do say NOAA related science because it's not only about marine scientists. NOAA does often also employ economists, engineers, right? Like NOAA is not only about people who study animals that live in the ocean. And I think that that's a misconception, right, that people might have. And I think that that's a misconception of marine science in general, right, that if you're a marine biologist, you study whales or dolphins, right? And there's so much more to marine science and marine biology than just that. And so um, these programs that, that we're talking about, you know, um, are a part of the like cooperative science centers that, that uh, NOAA has. And there are a list of different cooperative science centers, um, and they are based out of different universities across the country. And you know, um, students that are part of these cooperative science centers, right? They get opportunities to get you know experiences in different areas of science. And Jordan, you mentioned yourself that you're part of CCME, right? Which mm -hmm. is the one that's held at FAMU. Right. And yes. so, Lonnie, mm -hmm. yeah, right. And I think that that's really great. Like Lonnie was a part of LMR CSC, and that was at University of Maryland Eastern Shore. But I was also a part of LMR CSC and that was at Hampton University. So these science centers, cooperative science centers, right, like they um, 
they bring together students from different different universities and like they have these you know forums where the students can share their work and the students are able to connect and build you know um and build long lasting hopefully relationships like that's how i met lonnie years and years ago over 10 years ago because of these programs that noah has right and so um i think that noah is trying to this is the this is the effort about recruitment, right? Like this is the effort to get people in the door to get people introduced right. to marine science, right? And so hopefully with some of the things that Noah does in the future and as we move forward, we can talk about more, you know, how we can do more things to retain the scientists, to keep everyone here, to keep us working through the agency um, and, and making sure that we're always being able to constantly reach back, right? To make sure that we're doing exactly what you asked about Jordan and what Lonnie alluded to and the things that Lonnie mentioned that Sanctuaries does, you know, and connecting to community groups who are, you know, working with the, the audiences that we don't typically see in marine science. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that was, <laughs> that's perfect. You both <laughs> actually really covered <laughs> all of the main points. I just wanted to, the only other thing I would add um, is, is like a, a major goal of the sanctuaries as a whole and each individual site is, is access um, to sanctuary resources. And when I say resources, people are like, oh yeah, coral reef, that's the resource. But there's more to it than that. There's tourism, recreation, jobs, economy, like those are all resources right. that sanctuaries can give us and things that I think we can provide access to every community, right? Um, and so a lot of the sites are working with different groups to try and provide to, to remove barriers to a lot of those resources, partnering with, with, with Outdoor Afro to get people into our sanctuaries or partnering with the National Association of Black Scuba Divers to help do swimming programs or the DC Weekend Fish program to help teach people how to fish. Um, e even partnering with Black and Marine Science with your communication internship. Um, to, to <laughs> trying to, <laughs> right, trying, trying to, 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 to create these pathways that haven't always been there. Um, and I did also want to, we might talk about this later, but also like a plug for the, 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 the different avenues for getting into NOAA as a, mm -hmm. as a career for the recruitment that Simone was talking about. Um, that's kind of a lot of, it's a major one of my talking points whenever I'm out doing an event. I'm always talking about sanctuaries, but I'm also always talking about NOAA and how like this isn't just some far away organization like NOAA is us it's me like I live here you live here you can work for NOAA like there's no reason you can't um and I didn't I didn't know about a lot of these programs that they were talking about I didn't know about a lot of those scholarships and so imagine imagine all the people all the other people who don't know about that stuff right right so that's important to me to try and f work to fix well that's actually opens up our next question. And so we can start with you because you you just opened it up. Um, what are some open, open application opportunities and just career paths and opportunities for, like you said, anyone interested in forming a partnership with NOAA or Sanctuary or just anything? How do we go about that? Yeah, so I know there's probably more than this, but I will talk about the Nancy Foster Scholarship uh, which is a really big one for grad students. I think in like the last year, whatever graduate program you're in, master's or PhD, um, you can apply. The applications for, I think all of these scholarships are still open by the way. So definitely like if there's a link to put in the chat, if we can do that, or if you can just Google it, the Nancy Foster Scholarship, um, that one, it's, it's great. It, it's an amazing scholarship. It's pretty competitive. Um, there's also the Halling Scholarship, which is actually one that I applied for and did not get but that's okay because that means it's a really, really good scholarship. Um, and then there's the, the EPP MSI scholarship. Uh, those are both undergraduate scholarships for, I think if you're entering your junior year, right? Yes. So between sophomore and junior year um, and that, this, they give you money so you can like mm -hmm. feed yourself. Um, and they also provide an internship opportunity, which is a great way to work with your sanctuaries. Um, there are also, I think there are, each individual sanctuaries might have their own different opportunities to work with them that are outside of the big NOAA umbrella. So if you are living near one, or even if you're not, contact your nearest National Marine Sanctuary and tell them 
I want to work with you and they will usually work something out. Awesome. So um, Lonnie, what about, do you know of any opportunities? App open application opportunities? Yeah, I think one call out and I think Simone Mayo, she did put it in, is the Office of Education. To me, there are so many opportunities out there that that should be a one-stop shop is to check out the many of those programs there. And I think the thing that I, the, the shout out I will give is that within NOAA, we have so many people who are, you know, our scientists in our labs and here at NOAA headquarters who are very passionate about working with young professionals and with students there that are passionate about the mentoring aspects and getting folks involved in this area of science. So within, across each of our opportunities there, I really like to make sure that folks know that, hey, these are opportunities that when you come in, uh, folks want to want you to learn. They want to pass on that knowledge. They want to take care of you. They want to see you grow there. And I'll say me and Simone and so many other of us wouldn't be here if it wasn't for those opportunities there. So definitely want to serve as a resource and uh, as a follow-up. Office of Education is a good first stop shop and use us as a resource to continue this connection um, to, to help you along. Okay. Well, um, I kind of want to close out with this question. Simone, I'm going to come to you for this question. Um, and this is kind of just the pivot off of everything you just talked about with the opportunities. And I know we talked about how NOAA and National Marine Sanctuaries offers a lot of spaces and opportunities for growth down these career paths. But um, Simone, I would ask you, what advice would you give NOAA on how to better engage these organizations and these outreach communities? Because I know we could always grow and be better. So what advice would you give and what would you like to see from the future of NOAA and engagement? Yeah, um, so I think that, you know, I think first I would like to, you know, acknowledge the things that I have seen as successful, you know, I think, <laughs> and again, I just want to, you know, talk about the fact that when National Marine Sanctuaries, um, you know, came to, to BIMS and, you know, wanted to, offer an internship, but didn't, but did not, did not say, hey, I, we already have this written out and we just want you to send this to your members. It was not like that. Instead, it was, you know, in the format that Lonnie alluded to where they came and approached them and asked, you know, we would like to partner on an internship. What would it look like for you? Like, what do you all think would be important for us to include? And, and it was crafted jointly. And I think that that's a very critical piece is that when, when NOAA and when other organizations and agencies and uh, want to do work with, um, I'm going to right now, just for the sake of ease, I'm going to say like affinity groups, right, that work within, within or uh, organizations or nonprofits that work within um within your realm of science, if you want to partner with them, like come to the table and ask them, like, what do they want? Please don't come to the table with uh, a preset menu saying like, this is what we have to offer and this is it because your preset menu may not, may not be, um, may not be something that, that their audience, right, is is able to to work with, and so right. like, how can we how can we meet their audience where they are? I think that right. that's really important, and I think you know I also want to acknowledge the fact that um, that NOAA's uh, National Marine Sanctuary and the Office of Ocean um, Exploration they have um, did they had a grant that was about a DEIA grant so diversity equity inclusion and access um, and it was mm -hmm. an ocean exploration education grant and with that grant um, BIMS was able to get awarded the funds to get seven undergraduate students scuba certified this past May so this is a really big deal because you know it costs money to get scuba certified right like and uh, we were able to pay for the students to get scuba certified and on top of that 
the students were able to also get like experiential opportunities in the field, which is really critical to helping you get more competitive scholarships and internships, right? Like that's part of the reason why some students don't get these more competitive scholarships and internships because they may not have those experiences that their neighbor has, right? Because they've always <laughs> been doing, you know, these things with their family, with their friends or with their school. And so we were able to build a program where we were able to not only get the students school be certified, not only to pay for their travel, you know, and their accommodations there, but also to give them opportunities to tour different labs, um, mm -hmm. to do kayak cleanups, to do dune restorations, to um, do coral outplantings. And so like they were able to get a lot of different experiences within a week of um a week's time period. And so I definitely want to acknowledge the things that I think Noah has done recently to help move forward, right? These kinds of um, uh, opportunities to engage with, with different communities and to make sure that these communities know about the ocean and can right. be involved in, in, in working uh, in working with the ocean. And then to talk about things that can still be better, right? Like, again, a huge advocate for um, the Office of Education and those programs, because I too went through the EPP program, right? So I'm yeah. a huge advocate for them. I think that one opportunity that they know exists and that we are trying to figure out how to address is the fact that there are many of those scholarships, like the EPP program, for example, um, they get students from the same universities over and over again, because you kind of build in like a, a system of trust, right, within these universities, like FAMU or Hampton or doing MES, for example, right, like you you already have the relationship there. So it's easy for the professors and the, and honestly, the students that are in the program to tell the students that are coming behind them, hey, apply for this program. I applied last year. So make sure you apply too. Right. right? Like that's how I knew about it. There was someone who was in my uh, in, the, in a class two classes ahead of me and she got the scholarship and told me about it. So I knew, okay, make sure that I keep my eyes open. So in sophomore year, you got to apply to EPP, right? And so I think that there's an opportunity to make sure that we reach other universities besides the ones that we are so accustomed to working with. Like how do we build new relationships with universities so that we get students that we haven't seen? Um, right. That, that would be something that I think we, we really should start looking into. And, and I would hope that partnerships with organizations like Black and Marine Science, like, mm -hmm. like Outdoor Afro, would provide an avenue for us to build new relationships with students and individuals in, in schools and universities. Right. I will say personally, just having graduated with from FAMU with support from NOAA, being a CCME scholar, and then now having this Black and Marine Science internship. And I will, like, I'm literally a byproduct of all the hard work you guys have been doing. So I feel like I can say firsthand <laughs> as a testimonial, number one, thank you. Like, just seriously, thank all of you guys for everything. Seriously, um, the internship is amazing. This opportunity has opened my eyes, showed me so much. Um, just this conversation alone, I've learned so much. I'm pretty sure our viewers have learned like so much. And we not only learn, but we have things to take away and homework to go do and things to apply for. <laughs> so um, yes, yeah, seriously, thank you. Like coming from me, thank all of you, like Lonnie, Mark, Simone, like Leslie, all of you guys, like, Thank you, because I see firsthand the hard work that goes into it and then that goes the steps that it takes to get to the point to where I, I can't even apply for the internship and the funding is already in place for me to do what I need to do. And then now I have an opportunity as a creative and as a scientist to merge my passions and to open like doors for people who didn't know that, oh, wow, if I'm creative, I can... I can still do it like what I want to do. So thank you. Thank you so, so much. And that was a great way to wrap up everything. I want to thank everybody on the live for joining us today. And if you have any questions from today's panels and you want to talk to anyone who was on the panel uh, personally, their Instagrams and their contact information will be dropped below. And make sure to follow Black and Marine Science for more events this week. And then up next, we have a presentation on dynamic energy budgets and how they can be useful 
for research today at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So make sure you visit our websites and register and you don't want to miss that as well. So thank you again to everybody who came. Thank you guys for, thank you. Just, just thank you. This is so amazing. And I'm really excited to see NOAA just grow, National Marine Sanctuaries grow, Black Marine Science grow, and everyone just developing these careers.